Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Measuring Tools, Geometry, and Surface Finish. I am Amanda Harmoning. I am an admin assistant here at AERA, and I will be moderating today's event. And joining me is Rob Monroe. Hey, everyone. Yeah, Rob Monroe here. I look after membership and technical development here at AERA. And uh, Amanda and I will both be in the background today to help answer any questions you may have throughout the webinar. She's going to show you in the next few slides, sort of in the top right-hand part of your screen, there's a control panel, and she's going to show you how to use that. And uh, also, uh, we encourage you to put questions in the questions box for Bob at the end of the webinar, as well as if you, if you have any questions for Amanda and I throughout the webinar, you can put those in the questions box as well. And uh, yeah, we look forward to today's presentation with Bob. And right now, I'll go back to Amanda, and she will show you how to use that control panel. All right. First up, there's a couple different ways to listen in to today's webinar. The first is to dial in via phone. And if you do this, just make sure you have that correct radio option selected and you've entered your access, po access code and audio PIN. Um, this just makes sure that all the lines stay muted during the conference and keeps things rolling smoothly. So the other way is to listen in with your computer's mic and speakers. And again, just make sure you select that appropriate radio button for us. Uh, a couple other things to know. There is a little orangish red box with an arrow in it. This is the grab tab for the control panel. This allows you to collapse it during the presentation and make sure that it's out of your way so you can maximize your screen and view everything easily. And then the last one is the questions box. As Rob mentioned, if you need anything during the webinar or you have any questions for Bob, go ahead and enter those in there and we'll do a Q&A at the end and Rob and I will be answering some stuff in the background as well. So at this time, I'm going to hand things back over to Rob, and we'll keep going with today's presentation. Excellent. Thanks, Amanda. So just a couple housekeeping slides here uh, before we get on with Bob and the presentation today. For those of you that are joining us for the first time and you're not sure just who AERA is, we're an association that's been around since 1922. And uh, so we've been around a really long time. We're a nonprofit association. And uh, as you can see, even in the pictures, I mean, things have changed throughout the years. Uh, if you look at all the different buildings in our offices throughout the years. The one thing that hasn't changed for us, though, is our main goal is that we provide all of our members with technical engine information and specifications. And again, that's something that we've done right back since 1922. So by all means, please give us our, you know, our tech department. Give them a call. Uh, if you have any en engine information you're looking for, we really encourage you to do that, and we want you to take full advantage of that tech department and make sure to get full use out of your membership. Engine Professional Magazine, for those of you that haven't received it yet in your mailboxes, uh, it's going to be there any day now. I know I've talked to some members already on the tech line, and they're starting to get theirs now. So this is our third quarter edition of Engine Professional. Uh, it's loaded with all kinds of really good application-driven articles. And our goal with this magazine is that you should be able to read the articles from the magazine and apply some of that information right back into your shop or business. So uh, it's, it's a great reference. It's something to have on your shelf. You know, you can refer back to it with some really good articles. And if you're not receiving an actual uh, physical copy of the magazine, you can actually read it online. And we have a digital version that if you go to www.aera.org, backslash magazine.html, you'll be able to read the digital version of the magazine there. So uh, you can do it that way. Another thing that I would encourage you to do if you would like to receive a physical copy of Engine Professional and you're not getting it now, just let us know in the questions box. Just let Amanda know that you'd like to receive Engine Professional and uh, we'll get you signed up and we'll get that magazine over to you. So I uh, look forward to doing that. For those of you that uh, are looking to get some shop supplies here in the next little bit, before the end of the month, you want to take advantage of 15% off of AERA, and this is over a $100 order, but we do have a special on our, on our, uh, 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 some of our shop supply items that are on our stores tab in our, in our website. So simply go to the www.aera.org website. You'll see a tab that says stores. And you can just go in there and, and do your shopping, and you'll take advantage of that 15% off. Now, those of you that have been on uh, our webinars before, I, I know I beat this one to death all the time. And you have a contingency connection coupon booklet when you're a member. 
And in that booklet, there are discounts in there from different manufacturers. And the one that I'm really trying to draw your attention to is the AERA coupon. And if you've got process that's maybe going to be coming up to renew here pretty quick, uh, it's free money for you in there. It's $50 off for that renewal simply by using that coupon. So take advantage of that. If you're not a member of AERA right now and you're thinking that you'd like to be a member, again, there's some really good deep discounts in that coupon booklet for you to use. So take advantage of that. It's there for you to use. If you do take advantage of that booklet, um, here's an example. If you're a you know, a one to three employee shop, so a typical U.S. shop as an example, $399 is typically the annual fee, but by using all the discounts available in that contingency connection coupon booklet, you're 324 for the year or $27 per month. And we do have a monthly payment plan that you can do, and it's, there's no service charges or anything with it, so we can set you up that way too to take advantage of that. All right, one last slide here before we get started uh, with Bob's presentation. We still have three regional conferences left for 2019. TriStar Engines is our next one. It's August 9th. That's out in Wisconsin. We've got Liberty Engine Parts, September 14th in Pennsylvania. And our last one for 2019 is going to be Rottler Manufacturing. It's their open house, and that's going to be October 10th and 11th out in Washington. If you're close to any one of these regionals, I really suggest you try to get to them. There's technical presentations, there's exhibitors row, uh, there's always lunch supplied, uh, lots of one-on-one -on -one time with our reps. Uh, you know, Bob that's doing our presentation today was out in Bakersfield College when I was out there at the last presentation or at the last regional. It's a really good time to take advantage of, of uh, it's not so busy as let's say a trade show or a PRI or a SEMA. And uh, so it's, it's a good time to, to do one-on-one -on -one and get to see those guys. So uh, get out to those regionals if you can. If you want to sign up for them um, or you want more information, right there is the link for it. It's www.aera.org backslash conferences.html and, uh, and can get there and get registered to find out more information. Okay, so today's webinar, Bob Dolder is with the Sun and Product Company. And Bob is the Automotive Sales and Applications Manager at Sun, and, and I'm really excited to, uh, to introduce Bob today. This is going to be a great presentation, and uh, so I'm going to bring on Bob. So how are you doing today, Bob? I am doing fantastic. Could not be better. It's a great day in Michigan, and the sun is shining. So if we're all, uh, you see my screen okay? We're all ready to go? Looks good on this end. You betcha. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're going to start off just talking a little bit about the company that I work for, which is Sun and Products Company. Uh, it is a family-owned business since 1924, and we employ 690 people. We manufacture in four countries. Uh, St. Louis is the major place where we manufacture. There's over 600,000 square feet of manufacturing space in St. Louis. The other countries that we uh, manufacture in is uh, Irwin, Switzerland, uh, Shanghai, China, San Pablo, Brazil. And in those places, uh, we, most of the manufacturing that is done there, that manufacturing stays in those countries. We have 50 global distributors throughout the world. So Sun and Products is an international company. Uh, let's start from the very beginning. So in the beginning, uh, the early model engines required rebuilding every 500 miles. Blocks were honed in place. The tolerances were anywhere from a plus or minus of two, ten, two thousandths of an inch. And when we look at that and compare that to today, that's like a foot. And a lot of times it was hard to even meet that tolerance. Uh, Handheld honing methods were used. The dry honing with a vacuum, we used no coolant or oil back in those days. Bores were measured by ring gap. And the surface finish was measured by eye or by thumb. <laughs> in some cases, guys still do that today. Let's look at uh, new engine manufacturing today for a minute. New engines are more dependable, obviously. New engines last longer, over 200,000 miles. They're more fuel efficient than ever. Uh, the computer control ignition, we have intake and exhaust sensors, and 
the biggest thing is we have better materials and the better materials are constantly changing on us and that's what makes our job a little more difficult knowing what those materials are when we try to hone them. Uh, manufacturing tolerances are much, much tighter uh, than they were before. So therefore, it's a tougher job from us all around. And today we're going to talk about board geometry. And when we look at board geometry, we're looking at several different things. We look at roundness, we look at cylindricity, we look at concentricity, we look at straightness, parallelism, and perpendicularity. Uh, if you look over to the left here and you see the prints, this is what a lot of times when we're dealing with our industrial customers, that's, that's what we get. We get a print that we go off of and that's how we determine how we're going to hone a hole. Well, in some cases, our automotive customers see those prints as well, and they may take on a project like that, and they're going to need to know how to read a print. Uh, surface finish. Surface finish is something that is talked about more and more these days because it's so critical. If the surface finish isn't right, obviously, then we're going to run into situations where we're going to have either a, uh, an engine that's burning oil, the rings don't seat right, or, uh, you know, overall, the heat in the engine increases. So surface finish numbers are important. A lot of our customers today use profilometers and they look at these numbers here, such as RA, RK, RVK, RPK, MR1 and MR2. We're going to talk a little bit more about that here as we move forward. Crosshatch angles. Crosshatch angles are also an important part of today's engines in honing. Crosshatch angles can go anywhere from 25 degrees to 60 degrees and have a constant crosshatch angle as well as even less than 25 degrees depending on the type of material that's used in the block. So let's start with board geometry. And if we look at each, each one of these, we can create this board geometry with a hone or which can be a problem or we can, we, we can get the, the boring bar could cause some of this problem. But let's take the very first one here is barreling. Okay, in barreling, okay, what is happening is the middle of the cylinder is getting big where the two ends are getting very tight. The correction for a barreling like this would be to increase the stroke between the top and the bottom. A lot of people, rather than doing that, will hit a, uh, a dwell meter and hit it and dwell there and dwell at the bottom and actually create more problems by doing a dwell rather than just correcting the stroke. Bell mouthing. Bell mouthing is just the opposite where we're tight where we're big at the bo bottom and big at the top and we're tight in the middle. Well this is telling me that I need to shorten the stroke. So the hone needs to move exactly where the problem is. Bore marks Bore marks are caused by boring bars, generally speaking, and we need to get below those bore marks. In many cases, bore marks take at least five thousandths of material out of the total overall bore to, re, re, to get beyond the bore marks in the cylinder. And we look at tandem. Tandem can be a couple of things. Tandem boring, uh, where, where we have windows, like for example, in a two-cycle engine, that could be a type of a tandem bore. The other type of a tandem bore would be, for example, a piston. A piston where you have nothing in the center and we're trying to hone on the outside. And there are, there are solutions for that as well. And the best solution is to, to choose the correct tool to do that. And we're going to talk about that tool here in just a minute. Out of roundness. Out of roundness can be caused by, by several different things. The choice of the wrong abrasive number one, or having the wrong feed, number two, or having a very thin wall that we're trying to hone, number three. Those all can cause out of roundness of the bore. Rainbowing. Rainbowing, uh, we don't normally see this, but in some cases, if for example, uh, let's take a small block Chevrolet. Small block Chevrolet at the bottom of that bore, you have a what we call a semi-blind hole which the hone can actually hit that. And if it's constantly hitting that, what it can do is it can cause a rainbow at the bottom of that diameter. And that needs to be straightened out. Well, we straighten that out by a couple different methods. Number one, 
we have to go in and we have to relieve the bore at the bottom so we can get it to come straight again. Reaming marks, about the only place that you're going to see reaming marks in, is not going to be in a engine cylinder bore, but as an example, a valve guide. If we're using a reamer in a valve guide and we want a smoother finish, then we make tools, obviously, that will go in there and hone that out where you have better surface finish on that reamed hole. Taper. Taper is a, is a typical problem where we can't get out the bottom far enough and we do have to use our dwell to go in there and kind of, kind of dwell that. And in many cases, in uh, most of our blocks today, because of the, the bore where the uh, crank tunnel is, we run into that problem because that's where the block is straight, strengthened. So we need to eliminate that and again uh, using a dwell circuit on the machine is the best way to handle that. Undersize, well we all know what to do with undersize, we just need to make it bigger. And waviness, waviness can be caused by poor selection of the tool or poor selection of the abrasives or the wrong coolant, all those things can play a role. New engine manufacturing methods, geometry bore specifications. Manufacturers are regularly calling for tighter tolerances, all dimensions uh, specified such as roundness, straightness, cylindricity. Now these little marks right here is what you're going to find on a print. They're not going to say, I want this roundness. They're going to give a mark like this and then give a spec in a little box on the outside. That's how the print is set up. Torque plates normally are required. Uh, in today's engines, practically all of the engines today really should be torque plate honed. And the torque setting specifications should be set correctly. Again, bore geometry, creating a better cylinder bore. Torque plates, torque plates again, I, I will really hit on this because it's really, really important that the torque plates be set up with a gasket, it is critical. The proper torque settings, just like you're, you're putting the cylinder head on the engine block. So when the engine block is, is, is set up like that, you're basically telling it that there's something on there and the correct torque sequence is absolutely essential. New head bolts normally would be a good way to approach it as well. Uh, with lubricant. Uh, the correct spindle and stroke speed is very important also. Now when we mention this right here, uh, new head bolts with lubrication. Lubrication, you can put a little lubrication on, on the thread itself, but the important part of the lubrication on the bolts is going to be right underneath the bolt pad. Uh, that we uh, at Sunnan used to sell a very, very expensive torque wrench. It was made actually made by Ingersoll Ram, and it could tell whether or not the bolt had oil under it or not. So under oil underneath the bolt pads, very, very critical when we're putting on either the head or the torque plate. Bore geometry. When we look at bore geometry at Sun and Products, we look at several different things. We want to create the best bore geometry in a cylinder bore. Speed and pressure are both very, very critical in making a good bore. RPM spindle speed is determined by the bore diameter, the abrasive type that you're using, and the cross hatch angle that you're trying to achieve. That's just for the tool, just for the tool RPM. Now stroke rate is determined by the bore length and the cross hatch angle. So these two combined will give us the cross hatch angle and it will give us the best possible bore that we can create. Stone pressure is determined by the abrasive type, hardness, and it also, uh, and the required surface finish. So stone pressure is very important, but also we want to make sure that we have the pressure correct, because if the pressure is not correct, we can either make the abrasive go away real quick, or the abrasive won't cut correctly. So all that stuff is very, very important when we're doing this. Incorrect speeds and pressure may cause distortion. It will cause that out around bore or that tapering or all those things we talked about in the beginning. We use a little formula back at Sun and Products. We call it SMOPS. We're looking for the st what stone to use, 
we look at the mandrel or the tool type, the oil or the coolant that we're going to use, and the pressure that we're going to use, and the speeds that we're going to run. Bore geometry, creating the better bore geometry with ab abrasive selections. Now we have a lot of abrasives that we can look at today when we're, uh, when we're honing a cylinder. You can use diamond, CBN, the ALOC is aluminum oxide, and the SIC is silicon carbide. Super abrasives and diamonds are, are, are super abrasive diamonds and CBN are sort of the choice today for, for many different reasons. But number one, it's the longer life, the co they're cost effective, it makes the hone job go faster, and it requires higher speeds and increased pressure. It's production honing, and it can use either water-based coolant or oil-based coolant, used, a, used on spray coating and plated cylinders, such as Nicosil. Super abrasives are a great choice today for those reasons. But then again, we still have conventional abrasives. Now, conventional abrasives are much lower cost. They have the ability to keep a large selection in stock. So if you're doing a lot of different types of material, you can use those as opposed to super abrasives. Super abrasives, once you figure out what you need, that's, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna end there. And with a conventional abrasive, you can change surface finish numbers around a lot easier. And it's again, uh, we use them with a large selection of motors to be honed, different type of motors. Abrasive selection is critical, is determined by the cylinder material to be honed. Grit size is determ also determines the surface finish. Sunnen offers charts for recommended surface finish, and such as this one up here that you're seeing in this corner, it tells us, you know, for a hard block, we'll use that type of abrasive. And those charts are available through Sun and Products as well as in our catalogs. We have over 20,000 part numbers for abrasives between super abrasives, CBN, and silicon carbide and aluminum oxide. And we also make one other one besides that, which we don't use on internal combustion engines. The important thing to remember about abrasives is this, is how they actually work. And the best way and the easiest way to describe that is, it's like a piece of sandpaper that constantly brings up the abrasive again. So by doing this, we put pressure on it. We hold the abrasive together with a, a bonding agent. And in our conventional abrasives, we use basically glass and different hardnesses of it. Whereas in diamond, we use, uh, uh, we use metal bond. So if we're using a conventional abrasive, what we're doing is we're putting pressure up against it and we're using honing oil and it's breaking down and melding the, the bonding agent as the abrasive is breaking away from it and it emulsifies in the coolant that we're using. In the case of a conventional abrasive, that's always gonna be oil. So it basically suspends itself in the oil and that's what's doing the honing. Now it's a little different in super abrasives. Super abrasives are bond together real tightly when held by a metal bond. And by doing that, it acts more like a cutting tool as opposed to a honing tool. So, but it's still very, very critical that the pressure is correct and that we're using it the correct way. Again, all those different numbers that we have to have, we have to have the stroke speed, we have to have the spindle speed, we have to have the proper amount of coolant, all those things are critical in making a good cylinder. Bore geometry, again, a honing tool selection is very, very important. We make, uh, now this one up here on the right hand at the top, that's a glaze breaker, that's not actually a honing tool. If we look over here, our DH kit, that type of tool right there is used strictly for our super abrasives. It's used on our SV15s, sometimes used on our SV30s, sometimes used on our older hunting machines as well. 
this type of tool right here, which is our CK3000, has been the tool of selection for many, many years, although super abrasives, again, are coming more into play. Now, the, the highest quality tool that we make is down here. This is called a GH hunting tool. And in this tool right here, we have, we're showing that there's 12 abrasives around that honing head. You can get those with eight, you can get those with six, you can get those also where they're two stage. Two stage would be three of them coming out here and three of them coming out here. So six coming at a time and that would hone our rough and then the other six would come out to do our finish. It's a good time now to talk a little bit about tools and about how they're supposed to be maintained. Maintaining the tools are very, very critical. Think about what we're doing with a honing tool. We're making an abrasive that is coming off of that tool and coming off of that abrasive and it's gonna blend and it's gonna mix in with the tool that we're using. So in many areas of that tool, it needs to be checked on a regular basis and cleaned on a regular basis. In all these tools right here that I'm pointing to, all those tools have cones in them. And those cones can wear. And if we have a worn out tool or we have a worn out slot where that abrasive goes, or we have a, uh, a post here that starts to get loosed, all that stuff together combined can cause poor geometry. So it's really, really critical that we need to maintain our tools, constantly check them. I would recommend that we at least clean them at least at a minimum of once a week and check them at least once a month. Now in other types of honing, where you're honing a piston or you're honing a connecting rod, we have a chart that is available in our industrial catalog that helps you choose the correct mandrel. For example, if we have an open hole with no interruptions, that mandrel needs to be two thirds to one and a half times the bore length. If the honing unit shows has stones that are too long or too short, then we will not have that hole honed correctly. So it's very important to make sure that we choose that particular mandrel to be able to do that. Open holes with keyways have to have a bridge that will go over the keyway. Now, where we would run into something like this, there are some pistons out there that have like a, a keyway slot in it, and we have to have a tool that has a wide enough abrasive on it to be able to bridge across that gap. The other uh, area that we can think about is like on a two cycle engine, if we just had a single abrasive in there, that single abrasive would break on that gap. Whereas if we had a keyway style abrasive, the keyway style would bridge that across it. Tandem holes, tandem holes again, we need tandem holes need to have actually two times the length of the tool. To the, to the length of the piston. So if a piston, for example, was the, the width of it was a total of two inches, we would have to have at least a four inch tool to hone that pin in. Blind holes, we don't run into too many blind holes uh, in, in the business uh, in, as far as internal combustion engines go, but blind holes in a lot of cases, we have to modify the mandrel to be able to do that. Let's just talk about a few of our mandrels. One of the most popular ones that we, we see out here is this one right at the top. We're the only people in the world that make that. That is for our line honing machines. Again, the line honing machine is no different than any other tool that we use and it's interrupted holes. So that mandrel needs to be long enough to be able to do that entire block where we, uh, 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 so we can keep it nice and straight and round. Uh, these mandrels right here, we notice a lot of times we'll, we, we can recondition connecting rods, and that's what this type of a mandrel is for. The mandrel tool range that we make is actually anywhere from 60 thousandths of an inch all the way up to 60 inches. So we've got quite a range. We can hone quite a few different things with that type of a range. We also make what we call single stroking tools. They range anywhere from 0.239 up 
clear up to four inches. Single stroking tools have got diamond that is basically on the tool itself and you only stroke it through the bore one time and back out again. Where these are popular today is in valve guides in, in the internal combustion engine business. They use a lot of this type of a tool after reaming to make sure that they've got the surface, surface finish that they're looking for. That type of a tool is not, and I, I can't say this enough, is not designed to take a lot of material. On the norm, that type of a tool is designed to take five tenths, a half of a thousandth of an inch of material, and generally no more than that. Now, if you have, if you have our conventional abrasives on, a, uh, on our, our guide, valve guide hone, you can obviously take more than that. But those are used, again, with valve guides today. Back to bore geometry, creating better uh, cylinder bores. Bore measurements. Bore measurements are very, very critical today. So we want to make sure that we get the best tool that we can to come in there and measure the bore. And we always, we, there's, there's two types that are out there as far as dial bore gauges go. There's a two point is it, and that is preferable in our business. And there's also a three point gauge. Three point gauge when we're going around the cylinder and trying to check it in several different areas is a little bit more difficult to find whether or not the hole is actually out around. Uh, whereas with a two point gauge, we can check it and we can check it 90 degrees or we can check it at 10 o'clock and two o'clock. We're looking at overall uh, the, the cylinder in being round. We can also move it multiple times up and down inside and where uh, <clears throat> is the best way that it possible to do that today. Now our dial bore gauges are actually designed to work in coolants whether it be water or it be oil base. But it's really important let's talk about maintenance of these gauges. Maintenance is very important today. If you look at the bottom of our gauges, they have a carbide ball right here, and then on the other side, they have a pin. And they also have these guides right here, and those can be turned, and the ball can be replaced. Again, we're going inside a bore that is a little bit rough that may have some abrasive on it. So what happens is we're going to constantly, even though the ball is carbide, we're going to constantly wear against that and create flat spots. So it's important for us today to constantly be checking that, make sure we don't have any flat spots on it. And again, cleaning the gauge, cleaning, cleanliness is next to godliness when it comes to a gauge. And on a regular basis, we need to test that gauge to make sure that that gauge is reading correctly. Things inside that gauge can wear, and when you start getting some very unusual, unpredictable readings with the gauge, there's something wrong with the bell crank or something like that inside the gauge, and we can actually take that gauge back to Sun and Products, and we can rebuild it for you and send it back. Dial bore gauges and setting fixtures. Our setting fixtures, the same thing can happen. Uh, they need to be checked on a regular basis. In a dial bore gauge today, or a setting fixture today, there's pointed ends that that dial bore gauge can peak against. So we want to move that gauge back and forth and up and down towards us to make sure that the gauge is peaked and setting right. And again, we normally supply either a ring or a gauge. It's normally a ring today. Uh, it's not a gauge bar any day uh, today that can check to make sure that that thimble is reading correctly. Again, it's really, really important that we do that. Now, we talked about cylindricity at the beginning. Cylindricity cannot be measured with a dial bore gauge. Cylindricity can only be measured with a pat gauge. And the pat gauge that we use at Sun and Products, we always test and make sure that our tools that we are making for the industry are correct and work right to make a good overall cylindricity. What the pack gauge does is it locks inside the cylinder and it traces the cylinder in several different, several different areas and then it draws a graft as to what that cylinder actually looks like. Now most customers cannot afford a pack gauge or they cannot justify it in their testing facilities. 
uh, pack gauge on average is anywhere from a quarter of a million dollars on up. So that's why we have one at Sunnan because honing holes is our business. And I mean, you'll find these like in places like uh, General Motors or Ford or places like that, they use pat gauges. Bore geometry contrib contributes to bore distortion. Not using a torque plate to summarize is one, uh, the torque plate, uh, torque settings and sequences, poor quality tools. Again, check those tools make sure that those tools are always clean and always nice and tight. If they're not, it can cause what we call a stacking issue. And as we stack things up, we can make poor geometry and we can create a problem that doesn't need to be there. Incorrect abrasive selection. Again, another very, very important thing is to make sure that the abrasives that you choose to do the job that you're doing are correct. Incorrect spindle speed and stroke speed is another thing that will cause it incorrect stone pressure and incorrect coolants. New engine manufacturing methods. Okay. So if we look today at uh, a, a profilometer, which a lot of customers, but we figure about 25% of the customers out there that are doing engines today now use a profilometer. What is RA? It's a rhythmic uh, uh, average roughness. RK is a core ref, uh, roughness depth. RPK is the reduced height peak. RVK is a reduced valley peak. MR1 is a peak material ratio. And MR2 is the valley ratio. Uh, RAs usually range some, if we we're just checking RA, between 25 and 30. So let's take a quick look here at RA. Okay, if we look at these two pictures, the one at the top, the RA says it's 94. The one at the bottom says it's also 94. Now, let's add in RK, RPK, and RVK. So if we look at the very first one here, this one right here, we look at the RA is 94 and the RK is 322, RPK is 102, and RVK is 102. Okay, so that RK number is right in this area. That's the core. Now let's look at the bottom one. If we look at that one, the RA is still 94, but look what happened to the RK. The RK now is at 75, and the RPK, which is the valley down here, is now only 35, and our, uh, the RPK, I'm sorry, is now only 35, so there's, the peaks are much less at the top, and the RVK is 385, so it's just measuring just these little slices that are coming down here off the bottom. So this is why it used to be RA was enough, because rings were forgiving, our specs were wide open, in today's world with a tooled steel ring, we don't have that anymore. So we need to be very, very careful to make sure that we're creating the correct surface finish. A little bit better show of this is showing you here where this is our RPK number up here at the top. And if we go over here to this side, we, we see a, uh, uh, the uh, MR1. MR1, generally speaking, is around 5 to 7 percent. And the RK is the one right here in the middle. Okay, that's the core. That's what's really going to be left. And then the one down here at the bottom is your RVK. That's your valley where it's going to hold oil. So, again, if we look at what we call the Firestone curve, which is our MR2 number, generally speaking, we want that number somewhere between 80 and 100%. You cannot achieve, but 80 to 90% is generally where we want to keep those numbers. Creating better cylinder bore finish, plateau honing. <clears throat> now, plateau honing, almost all the new cars have a plateau finish. A plateau finish tries to keep to, to uh, it, um, I'm sorry, a plateau finish tries to copy a broken in engine. It tries to, but it does not. It, a ring still has to break in. In the past, plateaus were created by the ring wearing in. And 
at no longer, uh, and it took longer to break an engine in. Uh, back in the day, you know, they tell you to drive it 500 miles and vary the speeds and then change the oil and do all that. Uh, we come right out of the box, right out of with a new new engine today, and we run it for 3,000 miles or better before we change the oil. It does not eliminate break-in in an engine, though. Ring slide on the finished surface is low drag. Large valleys allow good oil retention, and that's what we're looking for in surface finish. Now, there is a, a formula that I've got up here right now that will actually tell you when you're using a certain grit stone and what kind of finish you're going to end up with. And this is the way the formula works. I'm going to give you an example. The existing finish was created by 220 grit silicon carbide uh, in a cast iron block, and it created an RA of 20. Next, we used a 400 grit silicon carbide and created, uh, that creates a 6 RA. So if we take 20 minus 6, that equals 14, and we divide that by 100,000, that equals 0 0.00014, and that's the total amount of removal that we need to do with a 400 grit. If we take any more than that, then what is going to happen is we're going to actually have a 400 grit finish, and we're going to lose our valleys. We're going to lose our RK, our RK, which is our core. It's going to be much less than what we're shooting for. So again, you need to be careful with a fine abrasive when you go to create that final finish. Plateauing, again, there's two methods of plateauing. Uh, besides using, you can use a very, very fine diamond or a very, very fine stone, but it can be created with a set of brushes, or it can also be, be created with a plateau brush with nylon impregnated abrasives. Cleaning the cylinder of torn and folded metal this is really, really important when we're using diamond because diamond will, in fact, create torn and folded metal. Okay, let's talk briefly about cross-hatch angle. Cross-hatch angle is very important today, obviously, because it's going to control the ring spin. Uh, and we can measure the top, middle, and bottom of the bore. It may require a cross-hatch angle. Very seldom can we get a constant cross-hatch angle unless we've got a machine that will actually create that. Because whenever we have switch from top to bottom, bottom to top, it's going to flatten out the cross-hatch angle a little bit. But the main thing is that the cross-hatch angle is where the ring travels. And we can create that with the honing machines that, that uh, are used in the automotive rebuild business today. Okay, so we measure across two lines, including the crosshatch angle. Typical automotive uh, crosshatch angle uh, on anything on the road today is generally 45 degrees, and that's an inclusive angle. There's a couple of exceptions to that, and that would be the Harley Davidson or the Subaru. Both of those uh, ask for a 60 degree crosshatch angle. And then Nicosil and thermal sprayed hyperutectic also is uh, 10 to 15 degrees. Uh, diesels normally are 25 to 30, inclusive angle. The best thing to do when it comes to surface finish numbers and, surf, and whether or not what the cross-hatch angle is correct is to check with the manufacturer on the cross-hatch angle, manufacturer with the surface finish, as well as the ring manufacturer can also help with these type of numbers. Okay, let's summarize the whole thing. The best thing that I would tell a customer today, if you're honing blocks, is that you need, when you're all done with a block, that you should have what I would call an application chart. And I would put down all the information that uh, relates to what I just did on that engine block. So obviously the type of block, the bore diameter, uh, where you started and where you finished, the bore length, top to bottom, the material of the block, ductile cast iron, okay? And again, I'm just using this as some, some examples. Surface finish numbers, where is the RPK, the RK, the RVK, the MR1 and MR2? Again, I'm just using some random numbers here. Abrasives, what type of abrasives did we use? 
amount of stock removal on the abrasives was how much was that the crosshatch angle where we set the crosshatch angle a lot of customers today are also uh, keeping a rockwell hardness tester and they will tell you what the rockwell hardness of the block is the feed rate what the feed rate is the total rough speed and finishing speed uh, and the extra information you know what did the block need above and beyond what we did with this toning it for example the block needed to be relieved at the bottom of the bore if you have all this information and you present it to the customer when you present him the bill you have two copies one for yourself for your own file and then one for the customer so the customer knows exactly what he got and if the ever customer ever comes back on you you got something that says hey this is exactly what we did to it and you agreed to it by signing it Sun and products today offers a large range of machines depending on on your production uh, automatic uh, bore correction uh, digital uh, bore profile display which displays both sides of the bore uh, many different uh, operator languages uh, they're CNC controlled and PLC controlled and operator training and service in your shop and folks I hope you enjoyed it that's all I have for today if you have any questions uh, please uh, ask them and we'll go from there excellent Bob thank you thank you very much that was a great presentation lots of really good information there um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in actually um, the first one is yeah the, this gentleman's asking does Sun carry the high performance diamond or CBN uh, abrasives for the CH100 line hone mandrels uh, that's a very good question and the answer to that question is absolutely without a shadow of a doubt no we've tried that several times and what happens with the super abrasives is they they want to uh, conform to one hole size and because of the way the, the 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 tool is built and the way the tool can shuttle it will it will absolutely not create a good hole a round hole or a straight hole so unfortunately no we have been working on a possibility of a mandrel that comes out with that but the abrasive would have to be uh, all inclusive and the tool absolutely would be very very expensive there are tools out there by the way that you can buy uh, micromatic actually makes them and they're used on the production lines and they're what they call single pass tools those tools on average are about thirty five thousand dollars a tool to do one size and that's for major production but that's the only thing out there right now so I hope that answers your question I'm sorry we can't help you there all right super um, Here's a question, and this one comes, this is, this, we get this question on our tech line all the time, actually, and this is a good one. Um, honing the Duramax GM block with the top of the cylinder being harder, does the machinist need to set up the machine different from a normal block? Uh, absolutely, uh, they, they do. Uh, what's important there is remember that the top is harder than the bottom. So therefore, you need to come out of the top much higher than you normally would. Normally, if you read the instruction manual for most honing machines, they tell you, on average, to start with, you, you go out the top, overstroke about three-eighths of an inch, and overstroke out the bottom about three-eighths of an inch. Well, in the Duramax, you can go as far as an inch and a half out the top, or as long as the tool is, you can go half of that. So if, in fact, that abrasive is three inches long, that means that you can come out of the top by an inch and a half by doing that that will keep the tool or the hone where it needs to be at the hardest part of that block and that's going to be at the top and it's not going to hone as much out of the bottom and whether it's conventional abrasive or super abrasive either can be used that way okay excellent um, one more question for you uh, this gentleman's asking, how does an end user measure, measure crosshatch angle, or do you just rely on the word or reputation of your machinist? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
there's 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 a very inexpensive way to do it and it, it's basically you can get what they call fax paper okay and uh, uh, many of your uh, uh, ring manufacturers actually sell this I know that uh, uh, total seal also has it available but what it is it's almost like a wax paper and you lay it on the board okay and then you just you you pay, uh, you uh, uh, run a uh, like almost like a glue on that paper and then it impregnates that cross hatch angle in that paper and then you take it take it off of the bore lay it down and then just just check the cross hatch angle in that manner with the correct uh, measuring device so it's really not very hard at all easy to do now they make expensive machines that will do that but you don't need to invest that kind of money uh, fax paper just remember that and that's what you need okay that's a good tip thanks Bob um, all right, here's another one for you. Uh, can you explain the best way to line hone an aluminum block that has iron powder or steel caps? Yes, it's a question that we get on a regular basis. Uh, iron powder caps and, and steel caps are, are actually bimetal product to aluminum. So if you normally would set the, uh, you would set the line hone mandrel up so you would have equal distance from the top and the bottom, meaning the guide shoes and the abrasives at the top and the bottom are equal. Now, if we do it that way with an aluminum block, what's going to happen is that mandrel is going to want to push into the aluminum and make the hole out around and try to take all the material out of the block and not out of the cap. So what we need to do is take a dial indicator uh, with, a dial, uh, a, a, with a magnetic base and hook it to the machine and we need to measure and make sure that the abrasives are coming out further than what the guide shoes are. So we set that up. Normally I would tell a customer you start off with 10 thousandths of an inch and if, it, if it's doing the job, leave it alone. If it isn't, we can go as high as 30 thousandths of an inch. And that will make the whole round again, and we will not push. It will push more into the cap where it's out around, as opposed to the block. Now, there's one other exception to that, and I did experience this and was able to solve this problem with the customer. Is the customer had iron powdered caps that had a 62 Rockwell in an aluminum block, and you'll find that the new Corvettes are that way. So what we had to do is, opposed to setting the block in the machine upside down, we made some brackets and actually set the blocks like it was sitting in the in the engine or in the engine compartment. So all of the weight of the mandrel was sitting down, and we were able to do it that way as opposed to the block being upside down. And again, we still had to extend so the abrasives were coming out further than what the guide shoes were. Okay, all right. Um, another question, another question, Bob, for you is: uh, when, when honing with non-diamond uh, stones, is it is it you know is, is it recommended to let the block cool down? Um, you know, is there heat generated there, and should you let it cool down bef before finish honing? Uh, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, because it's going to breathe on you. Uh, remember, you're you're honing a part that is is uh, got good strong material at the top, and it's good and strong at the bottom, and in the middle you got a water jacket. So therefore, it's going to do what we call breathing. Now, when we're when we're honing with oil, and if you're using conventional abrasives, yes, you are honing with oil. If we're honing with oil, it, oil oil will create heat. So when that heat is created, now it's going to try to move that around. So what I would highly recommend to a customer is leave yourself a little bit of material to go, a half a thousandth or so, let that block cool all the way down, and then go back and finish honing it. And when you finish honing it, then you should skip every other hole. And that will give you the best possible uh, scenario to give you a good, round, straight hole. Good okay. question. All right. Um, okay, so we got time for about one more question here. Um, 
So if if you're measuring the pin end of a connecting rod and a piston with the with the AG three hundred gauge, what is the best way to set up the gauge? A lot of customers that I've been into when I do that <clears throat> is I see them taking a zero to one inch mic, miking the the pin, and then setting the gauge up, and that's really not the right way to do it. The correct way to do that is there is a set of Joe blocks that, that we have. And those Joe blocks, basically, you take two pins out of the pistons, and you put those two pins in that Joe block, and then you tighten it down, and then you crack it loose about an eighth of a turn. You will hold that Joe block in one hand, and you'll use your fingers on the left-hand side, and you'll try to pull it that way. You want to pull the, the, the Joe block to the left, and then... Rock it back and forth till you, till you hit the highest point and set it that way. And that will give you not only for the piston, but it will also, you'll be able to check the connecting rod and tell whether or not there's clearance or interference there. It's the best way to do it. Okay, super. All right. Well, Bob, I really appreciate your time today. This was an excellent presentation. Um, any questions that we didn't get answered for anybody, uh, make sure to put those in the questions box and we'll get those over to Bob and we'll get those answered. Um, thank you, Bob. Again, much appreciated. Very, very good information. Well, I, I thank AERA. They're a great organization. We've been a part of them ever since they've been around. And, uh, and thank you for allowing me to give this presentation today. Everybody have a great day. Super. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm going to just go over to Amanda here real quick again. Uh, we'll just wind things up, and uh, Amanda has a bit of information to share with you. All right. As you all can see on the screen there, just a few last-minute things to make you aware of. First off, when you leave the, the webinar today, there will be a survey that will pop up. Take a moment and fill that out. Let us know how we're doing, if there were any questions that didn't get answered, or anything you'd like to see in the future. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Next up, tomorrow you will receive a link to the recording for today's webinar. This is yours to watch at your convenience. People on staff, um, do with as you please. So please keep an eye out for that. And then lastly, you'll see our contact information is there. That's the main line for AERA. You see for a phone number, that'll get you to any one of our staff. And you can see the email addresses are listed there for Rob and myself, as well as Steve and Karen. If you have any questions that don't get answered and you don't enter them into that survey, go ahead and just shoot us an email and we will get with Bob and get those answered for you. So again, thank you everybody for taking some time out of your day and attending today's webinar. And yeah.